So <clears throat> I have this secret that I'm going to share with you, and it's a secret I tell over and over again, and I'm still trying to figure out how to communicate it. Because when I tell you what the secret is, you'll want to believe it, but you'll want to believe it like you want to believe in Santa Claus. And then maybe I can wear you down by minute, I don't know, 30. And then you'll believe that it's possible for somebody, but it's not your thing. That somehow, structurally, it's not possible for you to have a share of that secret. And that's not true either. My goal within the next 45 minutes, I'll talk for about 20, I'll take questions, but my goal is to get you to at least be a little bit uncomfortable by the end of 45 minutes that the secret might actually be true, that you might need to change a little bit, that there might be an opportunity that you haven't yet started on. So uh, Google X is the part of Google that's been set up to take moonshots. And a moonshot is, very broadly speaking, something where there's a clearly defined problem. So it can't just be a frictionless surface. Uh, that's not a problem. There has to be some radical proposal for how to fix the problem, and there has to be some scientific reason to believe it's not completely crazy to try to go do it. So let's all recycle more. That's not a moonshot. Or the world's filling up with garbage. Okay, that's a problem. Let's all recycle more. Nah, still not really a moonshot. But Observing that it is now possible to make plasma gasification, an arc across uh, two plates that runs at about 16 to 18,000 degrees Celsius, that can actually turn garbage into its constituent atoms again, into a plasma, so that you can extract the uh, hydrocarbons that you want and basically create syngas from it, and then get the sludge at the bottom to be much more um, it's a tiny fraction of what's left, and what's left is easy to dispose of and is going to leak into the environment much less. So these things already exist. There are a few plants like them. We need to make these into garbage disposals. So that's a moonshot. Let's make it so that when you're done with things at the end of the day, you just stick it right in your garbage disposal, and out the other side comes natural gas, which goes right to your stove and to heat your home. We know that it's possible. It doesn't break any laws of physics. They're already really big ones. It's crazy that we actually truck the garbage to dumps, even if then we were to recycle it in some way. We should be doing it right in our homes. Now, we're not doing that right now, but that has the form of a moonshot. And the underlying ethos of moonshot thinking is the secret that I want to tell you about. We refer to it at Google X as 10x thinking. It's this weird, like this is the Santa Claus moment, fact that it's often easier to make something 10 times better than to make it 10% better. You guys having the Santa Claus moment? Because that's too good to be true, right? If that was true, everyone would do it. Actually, there are some reasons why people don't do it, but they're not because that's Santa Claus, because that's not true. That's not why they don't do it. So let's run the, the following little thought experiment. I have never had this go any other way than it will go with you guys, and will go particularly well with you guys. So I'm going to give you two choices. Choice A, you get to deliver a million dollars of bottom line to your business in the next 12 months, guaranteed, 100%, $1 million. Choice B, you get to deliver a billion dollars of bottom line value to your business in the next 12 months, with one chance in 100. One million, 100%, one billion, one chance in 100. So who's going for choice A with me? All right, that's why you guys all passed the math test this morning. Who's going for choice B? Yeah, all right, and even some paddles, plus one. Now, how many of you believe that your organization, that your CEO, wants you to choose choice B? Go ahead, raise your hand. We're at about 4%, 5 6 All right. So we're maybe at 10 15%. That's better than I usually see. If you already are at that place, I'm not sure I'm going to teach you anymore. Um, so you can just, like, read your email for the rest of it, for the rest of my talk. 
But I really question um, whether your CEO will give you the space to do that. For the rest of you, imagine going and saying, I think I can do this, but there's a 99% chance I'm going to fail. It's just not going to work out, and it's going to cost some money to do it, but the upside is enormous. Companies are not wired to give you that opportunity, even though you all understand the math, which is that if a bunch of people at your organization were all doing that, if you had a portfolio of those risks, then your business would be better off, because it's a 10 times better uh, thing to do, expected utility. You'd be able to hire better people, because it's just way more fun to work on the 10x stuff than to work on the 10% stuff. So you'd get better people, and so in this sort of virtuous cycle, you would end up winning faster because you had better people. It would actually cost less to retain them, again, because it's fun. You would stay longer and stay more mentally engaged because it's more inspirational. It's more passion-creating to work on something that's 10x instead of 10%. So... This is, so now we're moving from the Santa Claus to the maybe there's something there, but that's, that can't really be us. So let me tell you a little bit about why it works at Google. I assure you that this works at Google. Uh, the question is only, how can you do it at your place? So first, and I don't mean to trivialize this, because this is part of the hard thing. You all were like, oh, I don't know about your CEO and whether they'd really let you do that. We're blessed that Larry and Sergey want us to do this. So that's probably like half the nut right there. And you can do something about that. I'm not suggesting you all quit and join Google. I'm suggesting that you go back to your CEO and have a serious conversation with them. How much do you want me to make our business a tiny bit better every quarter? And how much do you really want me to make our business radically better? I can do radically better, but you need to have my back. I know that part of my job is for the trains to run on time. I'm not going to forget that. I'm not going to send everybody out to do crazy stuff. But you need to have my back if you want radically better. And it won't necessarily happen on the first year. And if you have that conversation with them and they say, I have your back, then you're in the right place. And if they say, no, get back in your box, 10% is good enough for me. I don't know, for some people that might just be your comfort zone. I'm betting for most of you, that's the, the right time to sort of check out LinkedIn and see where else you could go next. Because life is too short, it's just more fun to make something radically better. So Larry and Sergey are part of what makes it possible. The second thing is failing fast. Companies say that phrase, but they just don't do it. In order to do something radical, you have to be prepared for most of the things, literally 99% of the things that you do, not to work out, which is totally fine and it's not too expensive. If you kill them at the first moment when you could reasonably have known to stop doing it. But for all kinds of mostly emotional reasons, we don't. I mean, even we don't at Google X. It's incredibly hard to make this happen. If you're going to have a portfolio of these more radical bets, of trying things out, I'm not, and I assure you, you are not, smart enough to figure out ahead of time which of the hundred things you're going to try is the one that's going to work out. There's just no way. Like, may one person in a generation, like a Steve Jobs-like person, can just point and say, that turns out to be the right answer. So unless you're the Steve Jobs of this generation, the right answer is, try stuff. Just try stuff. But then you have to create a culture among your people that says, I value you trying things. There's nothing wrong with the learning moment. The failure moment is not the moment where we stop a project. It is the moment when we decide to stop a project and realize that we knew six months earlier, a year and a half earlier, that we could have killed it. That's the failure moment, not the moment six months earlier or 18 months earlier where we say, oh, that was worth trying, didn't work out, next. That's a learning moment, that's not a failure moment. Uh, one of the other things that I find helps enormously is you need to financially reward, you need to make obvious in public ways to the rest of your group that you value, you need to promote 
people who take these great risks. It is like being a scientist. Did you guys see The Economist this week? The main story in The Economist this week is about how broken science is. Because there's an incentive problem. There's no incentive to publish bad news, to say that your experiments weren't a success, or that you couldn't replicate somebody else's experiments. Even though that's sort of what underpins science, to wash out all the bad stuff, nobody does it, and so science is kind of veering off course as more and more money is coming into science. The same thing is true in your organization and in Google X, which is you have to say to people, you're running experiments, and I value the quality of the experiment you run, not the quality of the outcome of the experiment. If you say that to, believe, to people, they won't believe you at first. So the first couple of times when it doesn't work out, and you won't have to wait very long for it to not work out, because most of them are not gonna work out, you literally go hug them. I mean, hug them. Open champagne, make a party. It sounds absurd, but if you do that a few times, they'll start to feel like, wait a second, this feels different. There's something going on here. I feel pretty good about the fact that I was honest, and I don't feel like I'm gonna get fired. I think I might have actually done something that's valued by saying that it didn't work out. I could do something else instead of working for the next year on a project I don't believe in. <laughs> that's awesome. And I promise you, most of the people in your organization are working on things they don't really think are inspired. They don't really think are anything other than kind of patches to get them to the next year. And that's okay. A lot of the patching is part of keeping the trains running on time. But ultimately, it's like climbing the hill that you're on. You have to spend a lot of the time going up the hill that you're on because you're on that hill. You've, you've committed to that hill. But if you have all of your people on that hill, the best you can possibly do is reach the top of that hill. You have to send some of your people out into the wilderness. Some of them will get lost and be eaten by lions. That's just the way it is. But some of them will find a new hill, and that hill might be much steeper than the hill you're on, or might go much higher than the hill that you're on. And you have to reward them for doing that. You have to create a culture where everyone wants to be part of that team. And the way that they succeed is not by BSing the height of the hill that they're currently on, but by being good, loyal scouts and reporting back faithfully what they're finding. And then, if everyone feels like they're going to get transplanted to a better hill, as soon as you find and are quite confident that it's a better hill, then everyone is excited for the scouts instead of being angry that they don't get to be one of the scouts. I'm gonna keep going like this, but this is now your chance to ask questions. You should at this point be like meaningfully past the Santa Claus stage, but still feeling like, I don't know, it doesn't really seem like you know the pressures that I'm under and like how serious they are about the trains running on time. The stuff you're talking about sounds cool, but like 99.999% uptime is not compatible with 10x thinking and failing 99% of the time, Astro. I get that feeling. <laughs> Go ahead, ask questions. I'm just gonna rant until you do, but there's cool points for the first person who does. Who wants a cool point? All right, cool points. Uh, absolutely get by to what you're saying. Absolutely energized by it. The key thing about leadership and technology for me is to, <coughs> is to ensure that uh, I get the following behind me. How do you drive that incentive behavior to allow people individually to go from that leap of faith moment of standing there and thinking it's good what you're saying and wanting to do to actually becoming the ambassador. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are two related challenges. There's you evangelizing to your direct team in terms of making the changes in your organization. That is itself a problem. And then there's the challenge of getting the rest of the organization to adopt rather than fight the changes that you're trying to make. Are you asking the first one or the second one? Second one. Right. So... Uh, the second one, this is going to sound totally brutal, and I don't mean it to sound quite as Lord of the Flies as it's going to come out, but the beauty of great technology, of technology that makes people's lives radically better instead of very modestly better, is they just succeed more. You need to find a way to create in your organization an opportunity for the people who are fighting you to fail. 
I know how bad that sounds, but create opportunities for the people who use the better technology to have better careers at your organization. You don't want to hurt the organization, but you want to have it naturally undermine the people who won't come along. You don't have, there's not enough energy in any of you to fight all of the people in your organization and try to drag them with you into what's reasonable. But they're all basically self-motivated to succeed or anyway not to get fired. They want to be seen as positive by their peers and by their bosses. If the technology which you are trying to evangelize can help some of the people in the organization sell better, um, go home earlier, whatever that is, people will notice. You only have to create an environment where they can notice, where some of them can be successful. And one of the hardest things is that there's this temptation to do this kind of binary switchover, where you've committed to something for a long time, and now the big moment has come, and you're just gonna shut it off, like, like one of those old switches in the Frankenstein movies. Just and then the, the new one comes online, and everyone's just gonna like, like it or lump it. Those are really hard moments. That is sort of the antithesis of what I'm proposing, which is run an experiment. Find a beachhead in your own organization where people can become evangelists for whatever it is that you believe can make your organization radically better. Yeah? You use the word, uh, are people walking the word they believe? I guess belief plays a big role in that proposition you said. Huge. And Um, there's, there's a couple things. Yeah, sure, I'll repeat the question. It's a great question. Part of it is, how do you work out, you know, what you believe and, and the kinds of beliefs that you want to foster? And then related to that, when some of the people in your organization do believe and others don't, how do you sort out? I'm not going to go around saying, you believe, you believe, you don't believe. That's not fair. Uh, there's no way for me to judge that. Uh, I think some people are going to self-select out, some people self-select in, and I would like to believe that the passion, again, is going to cause, like I was saying before, is going to cause the people who do believe to be more successful. And the people who don't believe, ultimately, we don't have to reject them like a bad organ transplant. They'll just wander off, because no one wants to hang out with a group they don't really belong with. And so at Google X, the mantra, I know how Pollyanna-ish this sounds, but we want to make the world a radically better place. And we have conversations all the time. At the end of the conversation, we say, no, nope, that would make a lot of money for Google, wouldn't make the world a radically better place, next. And there's just, it's, it's joyous. Because, and I believe that it's actually financially smart for Google to have us think like that. Because then they get a bunch of people who are all as excited as I am to run to work in the morning because I get to be at a place where we get to say that to each other. It's just so invigorating to, that you get to say that and then everyone else starts saying it too. They're like, really? Because don't you all want to be able to say that in your daily lives, that you're not just trying to make money for yourself or someone else, that you want to make the world better? That's just fundamentally inspirational. I think it's a basic part of being a human, that we, we crave that, like we crave love or community. And if you say, that's what we're going to be like, you know, Google X is another one of these, uh, this is a separate but, but related Santa Claus moment. At Google X, we don't worry, we don't work towards, that's probably a better way of saying it, how we're gonna make money. In the early conversations about our moonshots, they do not include, okay, so then it would cost us this much and then we could charge that much and that nets out positive and, nope. It's the wrong way to think about it. Because if you're gonna make the world slightly better, then you have to claw for those pennies that you're gonna make. That's a tough business, it's just exhausting. If you make the world seriously better, 10x better than the alternative, the money will come find you. You really don't have to figure it out. And it, I can see from the outside how frustrating this looks to watch Google do this over and over again, because I think there's this attitude like Google's just kind of bumbling its way through the process a little bit. 
But over and over again, Google has put something out in the world, like search, like Street View, like Translate, Geo, most of the things, almost everything we've done has started from a, you know what? This is just the right thing to do. The world's just better this way. Let's start by helping users, and then we'll figure out the money thing in a little while. And that just, that shouldn't be true. That's like cheating in the business world. There's something wrong with that. But wouldn't that be awesome if you could do that? If you could actually spend your time saying, let's just make the world crazy better, and then trust that the money's gonna come find us. And it turns out, I think Google's had a pretty good run of it so far using that attitude, and so Google X is not creating some new attitude, we're just a distillation of the basic DNA of Google, which is this attitude, let's go pick a problem like transportation, human computer interactions. Uh, we have a wind uh, energy project called Makani. Uh, we have uh, a connectivity project, stratospheric uh, balloons called Loon. Just to pick one of those things and just say, you know what, it's not okay that two thirds of the people on this planet don't have connectivity. Let's just fix that and we'll figure out the rest later. And everyone just can't wait to be part of that project. People literally stay up all night working on that project because it feels so good. Yes? How, how do you tell the difference between whether you should be killing off the moon shot or just killing off a bad attempt to implement a good moon shot? Um, so it's a black art. I, there's not a bright line test. I probably shouldn't say it's a black art after all that like crazy positiveness, but um, it is an art form, I don't have a clear line, but there is a project which we have not made public yet, and we have just gone through a complicated process with that one. We'd staffed it up to kind of a medium-sized project, at least by Google X standards. Um, you know, it had a name, it had a mission, people had been working on it for more than a year. It was the sort of thing that was hard to kill. And we got to a place, we'd been honestly, in retrospect, kind of hazy about what the long-term mission was, actually, because we felt like we had such a good beachhead, like a first thing to do, that we felt like there must be a continent that sort of derives off of that beachhead. And then the team came back to me a year and a quarter in and said, looks like we got it wrong. That beachhead isn't so good anymore. And then there was this existential crisis for this group, and that crisis is not resolved yet, but we've essentially stopped growth for the group, and we've moved them off the technology problem and back onto the fundamental question of what are we trying to do here? And I think there's a 50-50 chance that they'll survive past the end of this year, but that's okay because these people understand that they're not gonna get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They'll be recycled into other groups or encouraged to start a new group, uh, a new project if that's what happens, using many of the same underlying capabilities that allow this particular thing to exist. So, I don't know, that's a, it's a case moment that happens to be going on right now. But I will tell you, it is infinitely easier to kill them earlier. So most of the killing that we do happens in the, the stage where it doesn't have a name yet. It's in that process where there's a few people half time working on the prototype, wouldn't it be cool if, and then we get to the place where we say, you know what, it just doesn't pencil out for technology reasons, for business reasons, whatever, it's just, and sometimes it pencils out, but by a factor two. And we say, you know what? A factor two isn't good enough because a factor two is just gonna get whittled down. Reality will set in. Because the truth is, if you shoot for 10X, you'll probably get 2X, and 2X is amazing if you actually get 2X. But if you shoot for you know, 2X, you're gonna get 5%. That's kind of the way it works out. Yeah, you had a question? Well, all right, so I'm gonna like get onto a separate soapbox, but I, this is a soapbox I enjoy just as much and I think it's just as relevant for you. Everybody thinks that moonshot thing, by this point in this sort of like uh, 
getting real about the Santa Claus thing, about the 10X, everyone's like, okay, I buy the moonshot thing, it's just not me. This is exactly the moment. Thank you for, like, you're a plant in the crowd. It's good. <laughs> but everybody thinks it's someone else. I, just, I hear this all the time. So the little companies say, well, that's awesome, Astro, but pff, you need tons of money to do that. So that's for the big companies to do. They can afford to take moonshots. We have to, like, scrabble it out every day. But the big companies say, are you kidding? We're like quarter to quarter. We got to hit our numbers. We have something to lose. We can't do moonshot thinking and 99% risk of failure. That's for entrepreneurs. They have nothing to lose. They take a shot. They don't make it. Whatever. If there's 100 entrepreneurs doing that, 99 of them will fail and one of them will be Facebook and Yahoo, right? Uh, the, the government's, you know, we look at them and we're like, oh, well, that's maybe where the moonshots will happen. It's where a lot of the moonshots have happened in the past. But if you go talk to governments, they're like, are you kidding? Have you seen how deep in the red we are? That's going to happen like 50 years from now, maybe, after all the baby boomers die out. So there, everybody has the reasons. The academics, they love to talk about moonshot thinking, but if you actually tried to take them to task about building a moonshot, they'd be like, whoa, whoa, I'm not going to, how do I get publications out of that? How do I get tenure out of b building one of these things? I'm just going to write about how maybe they're possible. That's my job. Everybody thinks it's somebody else's job, and the cool thing is anyone can do it. It, it requires bravery and creativity much more than it actually requires uh, money. So you're right, if you're running a very thin margin business, it wouldn't take too much money harvested from that business and spent badly to undermine the business. That's true. But, as you just pointed out, if you're just playing old tapes, you're dying really slowly as a business and you just don't know it yet, you haven't admitted it to yourself. Why not die quickly if you're gonna die? I, <laughs> I'm serious, life is too short. I would much rather get to the end, whatever the end is now than in 10 years. Do the shareholders even really want you to die slowly, they don't think of it like that, and maybe they don't care, I and mean, this is actually a serious problem. If the shareholders are only in it for the next 12 months, but you're trying to solve a 10-year problem, that is a serious structural disconnect, which does meaningfully impede moonshot thinking. This is one of the huge benefits that Google has, is that Larry and Sergey just folded their arms on the day they IPO'd, they said, we're in this for the long run, and if that's gonna bother you, just don't give us your money, sorry. And it sounded like maybe they were just being crazy kids at the time, but they were serious as a heart attack about that. And they've been incredibly consistent since then. And Eric Schmidt, when he came on board, was exactly the same. And now Google has set this expectation that it's going to place these bets. And it's a little hard to tell whether Google's ability to take moonshots is because it has the money, or in fact, whether it has the money because it has this attitude about 10x. I think it's at least half the second. Other questions? Yes? Um, have you thought about setting up Google X? Did you think, what's the trade-off between um, uh, setting it up as a separate team or embedding it in existing teams? I mean, uh, a 10x or a moonshot team in Android, another one in Chrome, another one in Apps, and so on. That's a great question. I mean, to some extent, I think the second already exists, though maybe not named that way, you were asking about Bell Labs. So when Bell Labs was formed, you had this enormous network that was already functioning, but wanted to get bigger and for technology reasons was having a hard time scaling. And then they created uh, Bell Labs as an opportunity to sort of get this big pile of PhDs that would solve these technology problems so the network could expand. And you know, we got the transistor and the laser and the satellite and all kinds of crazy cool stuff out of that. But they were solving a set of problems. It was a target-rich environment, a problem-rich environment for them. Google is not wired the same way as Western Electric was because we already have crazy, smart, inventive people in each of the groups. It's not like there's just people who are like churning it out and they're like, oh, gee, we don't know how to make the next generation. The innovation in the problems that Google currently has are so systemically wired in and the people are wired in that Android doesn't have a Google X within it maybe per se, but it was a Google X eight, nine years ago. And so it still has some of the, those people and some of that attitude. And I think most of the groups do. So that's exactly why Google X was set up 
not to solve any of Google's current problems, because there are already all these incredibly smart, creative people solving those problems, but to find new problems to solve, which in a way makes it harder than Bell Labs because we, weren't, we, we don't get handed problems, or if we can only solve the technology part of it, everything else gets golden. We also have the pressure of picking good problems, which is a hard thing to do, but it's a stimulating, it's an intellectually stimulating thing to do. I am not adverse to creating Skunk Works groups within an organization, but I do think whether it's, you know, within, you know, to use Google, to use your analogy, within Android, or more like Google X, where it's set aside from Google a bit more, the firewall that you create between the organizations is critical because they're culturally different. You're asking them to do different things, and it's, if you allow them to mix too much, you mix the messages of what's okay. Because there are people where you need them to do exactly what you expect them to do on the next quarter. I am in no way suggesting that the entire company, that at the Google or your companies could possibly run where everybody is just on their own to do something that they think is cool this quarter. Like, that doesn't work. <laughs> we certainly know that. But you have to have more than nobody <laughs> who's off in the weeds. Uh, it also is just a slow death, you know, with 100% guarantee, if you don't have some people who are really making the rest of the organization inspired and a little uncomfortable. Other questions? I'm happy to tell you some more stories. You guys want to hear, uh, we'll do the paddles. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, you have a question? No, oh, you're just practicing the paddles? You want to hear. All right, um, you guys want to hear about um, a moonshot that we didn't do or one of the things we're currently working on or, um, yeah. Uh, yes, <coughs> um, there, are, there are a couple differences. One of them is that we, we've only once so far built a moonshot that was very explicitly business to business. We were working on something in the construction space and we decided to spin that out as a separate business for a number of reasons, I think uh, having it be an independent entity worked best, but in the construction industry, as some of you may know, it's one of the largest industries in the world, it's one of the most broken industries in the world, and it is weirdly artisanal. When someone goes to make a $300 million building, they build it more or less, I mean, they realize that people have built buildings before, but they design the building from scratch, and then they can't wait till the design is done, because they can only do two or three iterations of the design in 18 months, to start building the building, because time is money, so they start building the building before the design is done, and then the building turns out to change, the whole design now is seriously flawed because they changed the design while they were halfway done building the building. This happens in every single building, by the way. This is not some weird anecdote. And then there's cost overruns, the building doesn't work out the way you wanted, the whole thing is an enormous mess and they repeat. This is all driven by the fact that the high priests in this field, I'm coming back to the enterprise question, who are the architects and structural engineers are paid by the hour. So this whole process is working fine for them because they love uh, Autodesk and AutoCAD because it makes them make like prettier and prettier pictures and they get to work on big buildings and it takes them a long time to do it and they have to have lots of meetings and they get to charge for all of this. So there's no problem from their perspective. The general contractors are different. So the, the biggest difference that I see is that typically when you're going to a consumer, they have a pain where you're taking their pain away. In a lot of the enterprise stuff, you may need to change whose pain you're, uh, who you're talking to, because Autodesk thinks of themselves as making stuff for the structural engineers and for the architects, and it's in fact the general contractors who really need to be holding the steering wheel. And that shift is, part of the innovation itself. You can call that, you know, sort of a disruption of the industry and lots of examples exist in other technologies and other industries. But I think that kind of mentality of 
who's really making the money here and who's got the pain. Usually those aren't the same people. And then how do we use technology? I mean, everything I'm talking about is a technology moonshot. There are moonshots that are not technology moonshots. The Gandhi salt march was arguably a, a moonshot, but a very, it's a social moonshot. But I think this is in that same realm where it's how can we use technology to disintermediate these people and help the group that's really in need get the help directly. We'll see how that goes, but that's an example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to use the example I was just giving you, that's not how it happened. It happened in the other way, where we went through the process of saying, where are the huge problems in the world? And we were just going down them, like the construction industry, manufacturing, agriculture. There's a relatively short list. It's pretty explicit. Hey, construction, who's got something there? How about smart windows? Nope. You know, just sort of churning through these things. Wait, wait a second. The real problem with buildings is, you know, there's much more detail, but it's essentially the story that I just told you. That's crazy. What if we just built the world's largest expert system where you could take a building and say, well, one more story. What if it, you know, had like a terrace there? And like this, in one second, the stairwells would be put in and the everything down to the last screw in the building would be put in all up to code. Like, let's just pretend total fantasy world, right? Then you could run an experiment a second and you say, well, you know, what if let's make it the building a little bit more energy efficient? How much would it cost? And then it makes the, the gla it switches out the glass around the outside for a higher quality glass with a higher R value. And Imagine if you could do that and you could iterate in a day you'd have the building that you wanted and it would be up to code pulling in all of this data from other places. When we got excited about what that would look like, then we convinced ourselves that it was possible and then we said, wait a second, the architects are going to hate this. <laughs> well, we don't want to not make it just because the architects are going to hate this. But if we're excited, it, and it really, let's pretend for a second, it really solves deep problems in this industry, someone's got to be happy with it. Oh, let's go learn. Oh, look, it's the general contractors who are losing their shirts every single time. You know, some, you know, 60% of them maybe actively won't like this because they actually make money when their cost overruns. But the better contractors that give fixed bids, they're the ones who are going to care about this. They're the better contractors anyway. The 60%, they deserve to die. And those 40%, this is my argument about just instead of having the fight, just have the ones who use it be successful. The rest will go away. Right, and by the way, this is not an anti-architect <laughs> diatribe. It's just that architects have drawn enough bathrooms. We don't need any more bathrooms to be drawn by any more architects for as long as humanity exists. We're done. <laughs> but that's like saying, you know, that, that AT&T undermined the switchboard operators by making it so that they didn't have to, like, do this all day. We aren't crying a river that people aren't still doing that because we see that those people got new jobs. As, you know, I think as a total aside, we do a horrible job in retraining in this country and in most uh, of the developed world, retraining people when their jobs are no longer exist into new jobs. But I believe that architecture still has a function and there will be experts at architecture using the new tools. I just think there's going to be some rethinking about what architecture means as the tools develop. And some of them will come along for the ride and some of them will just go the way of the dodo. Yeah. Well, I mean, I 
Uh, I, I mean, so I don't have Larry's job, and I mean, I'm glad I don't have Larry's job. So it's not a problem for me because the fact that Android goes this way or goes that way has no meaningful effect on our business. You know, a Google Glass, for example, has uh, the Android operating system within Google Glass. So we are part of the ecosystem, but that is no more sort of highly tied to them than if we had picked something else instead. If, God forbid, we picked Windows, um, you know, I mean, we could have, we wouldn't have, but we, we could have, and like, <laughs> other than the fact it was Windows, it would have been okay, right? That it was another company, or there was Android, it's almost the same thing. We don't have to know what uh, Google Plus, what the social side of Google is doing deeply, and when they change their direction a little bit, it doesn't change our energy project. So in that sense, I, I don't think Google is a holding company, but there are fairly different businesses, and especially a few of them like what we're doing at Google X, or a few others that you might know of, like Google Fiber, which are projects which are somewhat independent of the other parts of the organization. So I'm sure that the platforms part of Google cares a lot about who's going to be using the platforms, and they, they're not just like, oh yeah, social, you do what you want. Uh, obviously, there has to be um, more of a tight connection there. But I think that this is part of the challenge, and I, ha I have it in a small way. We have a lot of projects at Google X, but I have purposefully set them up like mini Manhattan projects. We have a bunch of shared resource groups. So there's a manufacturing group which like a SWAT team goes in and helps each of the new groups get set up till they have enough people that they can afford to hire their own manufacturing team. And then it kind of walks away and helps with the next group. And we have a user experience research and design part that's centralized so everyone can use them. So we have a set of these shared resources, but they're also fairly siloed. And it's like, if I'm making the future of wind turbines, I'm making the future wind turbines, and what Google Glass is doing, like I'll see them at the, Google X parties, but it's not really going to slow me down if they sort of move one way or another. That's your question? Yeah? Uh, I mean, certainly within Google X, that's me and, or, and Sergey, who I report to, but I mean, that's Larry. That's arguably the main thing that Larry does at Google is have this sort of light touch on the wheel where there's a lot of different things going on and he wants them to be relatively decoupled because if they're too tightly coupled, it really inhibits the innovation process in any one of their groups. And yet, he doesn't want them totally spinning off in separate directions that have nothing to do with each other. There are things that are strategically interesting to Google, like connectivity, you know, like, like fiber or the Loon project within X in a way that making sweet smelling soaps you know, whether that's a good business or not, would probably be less strategically relevant, and so you'd be somewhat less likely to encourage that. Um, so it's not a complete free-for-all, but I do think that if you want to have this portfolio of innovation across your organization, you need to keep them from being too coupled, or none of, they'll all feel like they're in a sort of collective straitjacket. So the, the second one's easier. We had someone who had built a project for several years at Google X, and the project outgrew them. They were no longer capable of building the project because it had left behind its technology phase and was becoming a business. This is only a failure moment 
if we let this person dangle in the wind and continue to fail without help, what we did was we said, you rock the house. Stop doing your current job. Move back into this role where instead of having hundreds of people report to you, there's nobody reporting to you. We trust you. Go make another Google X thing. You're a rock star. We're sure something great will happen. That's not a demotion in my view. That's a promotion. He, he was not qualified to build this thing to the next level, but eh, that's just not his thing. And he should be proud of the fact that he's an extraordinary world-class inventor. And he can then feel like, awesome, I have a clean sheet of paper, I got a, like a successful dismount on that one, and I get to do it again. So I think doing that, as long as you're managing them carefully, that one's easier to do. The hard one is if I say to Susie, this is a joke, we're not really doing this, that you know she works at Johns Hopkins, and she knows how to make an anti-gravity drive, and we do due diligence, we decide she's awesome. We convince her to come to Google X, she brings a couple of her graduate students with uh, her. We're building up this Manhattan project for um, doing this, now we decide it's not right. It's not like we can really use her in the next project. She's an anti-gravity drive expert. So you have to set expectations with some real experts in specific fields that Google otherwise won't need. This is a flyer. You should not come here as some kind of job security move. This is an exciting thing to try, and if it doesn't work out, we're going to tell you honestly, and we'll help you find something else to do within Google or outside of Google, but this is not a tenured position. And as long as you tell them that ahead of time, it's still hard, but it's doable. Guys, I'm out of time. I really appreciate your time and, and your questions. Thank you.